everyone. It's really good to have you back. I, I guess after lunch is always a difficult kind of thing, but we made it. So uh, there's our commitment. So uh, it's my honor actually to uh, well welcome you on behalf of University of Ljubljana um, at this event, which is actually organized jointly uh, with our colleagues from Freie Universität Brussel and the University of Warwick, our friends. Uh, it's, our, it's our, but also my personal, immense pleasure to present the achievements and the results of the Work Package 2 uh, of the Utopia 2050 project, so-called Educational Pillar. Some remember it as Educational Board and its activities. Uh, so it, it's a complex web of different activities that we conducted. I guess for three years and at least a year before that. Uh, so it's my immense pleasure to actually talk today and well, I'll be mainly listening to the uh, uniqueness, about the uniqueness of the Utopia educational model um, built and co-designed in our alliance by different stakeholders. Uh, of course, uh, there are many stories within this uh, ecosystem uh, that we uh, constructed. And today we're gonna hear something about that as well. Uh, and uh, let me just say that, well, the first round of pilots presented in the European Commission's 2022 work program shows benefits, but also some challenges for European universities such as uh, difficulties in implementing joint transnational educational activities and programs at all levels. This is something we already know. Uh, including incompatible requirements that prevent the awarding of joint degrees. We know that as well. We address this. Uh, therefore, we need to think about alternative models. We thought about it. Uh, and as you will see during this event, Utopia is particularly appropriately positioning itself in this broad range of different uh, alliances, partnerships that address this because it does not currently propose modalities such as joint degrees and traditional uh, modes of pedagogical collaboration that we all know of. Um, but builds on existing credit bearing units. We'll talk about this, I guess, more in detail afterwards, uh, to create links between institutions. So it basically builds communities. This is what our joint endeavor. Bustian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon to you all. Um, so dear leaders and coordinators of Utopia Educational Board, members of Utopia Learning Communities, uh, students, professors, and other academic staff of our Utopia family and invited partners of, uh, uh, Unif of University of Ljubljana. A special welcome goes also to the participants who are following us online. Uh, well, with today's uh, event, we want to present the results of Utopia Alliance to a wider audience, specifically our ambitious transnational Utopia educational model. Utopia Alliance is also home to 30 connected learning communities. Our partners from the Free University of Brussels, was that correct? Uh, and the University of Warwick will share the light on the perspective and potentials of transnational education. First, Professor Nadine Engels, Vice Rector of, for Education and Students from VUB, will have a presentation on behalf of Professor Dr. Jan Dankert. Head of the Educational Utopia Board, and rector at the VUB, who unfortunately cannot be present today. Nadine will explain the path from idea to implementation. Afterwards, Work Package 2 coordinator, Professor Dr. Rosette St. Jägers, will inform us about the uh, education policy of Utopia. And curriculum developer, Professor Dr. Joe Anguri, will give an overview uh, to the first pilot phase of the Utopia learning communities. After that, Professor Dr. Tomas de Jelan, We'll briefly summarize the work done in connected learning communities by University of Ljubljana. Finally, practical work in the learning communities will be presented by participating uh, academics and students from Faculty of Arts and School of Economics and Business. 
in the role of the Vice Rector for Internationalization and on behalf of the University of Ljubljana as coordinator for, uh, of the first pilot phase of the Utopia 2050 project, I would like to conclude by thanking all the Utopia staff who contributed to this task, specifically the leaders and coordinators from VUB, University of Gothenburg, University of Warwick. Special thanks for this valuable and excellent work goes to Rosette, Joe, and Jan. I wish you much success in the further development of Utopia more and in the sustainable implementation of these learning communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bostian, uh, for these kind words, uh, I guess. Uh, we will now continue, as Bostian already, Professor Marcoli already said, with the presentation uh, about how it all started. That's actually the title. Uh, from the idea to implementation, I, I know some bits, uh, I can tell you, given by Professor Nadine Engels, uh, Vice Rector for Education and Students of Freie Universität Brüssel. Uh, who will speak today on behalf of uh, already mentioned uh, Professor Jan Dankert, Rector and Head of Work Package 2 Utopia Educa Educational Committee. So, Professor Engels, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, good, um, good afternoon. As I am indeed a new Vice Rector of Education of the Vrije Universiteit Brussel. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not go going to try to step in Professor Dankart's uh, shoes and telling about what happened in Oto Utopia because I'm actually a novice in uh, uh, Utopia. So I've been exploring the um, Utopia landscape for the past uh, few weeks and I discovered that um, the goals and the activities of Utopia blend beautifully with uh, the future of our higher education that we have in mind at our university and with upcoming learning models in highlight just a few of these features. Um, first, the societal engagement. In the past decades, increasing concerns have been voiced about the disconnect between education and society and between education and employability. As institutions of um, higher education, we can and perhaps we should do more than what's offered by the alternative for profits and non-profit organization and initi initiatives beyond the mainstream higher education that pop up everywhere. Our task may be to educate students not only to equip them with knowledge and skills, but also to be and to act as responsible and engaged individuals in a complex society to make a difference people who think globally and engage locally. We've been stimulating active learning, experimenting with community engaged research and learning and transformative uh, learning for quite a while uh, now. And it's good to see that uh, Utopia European uh, University will help us further on this way. Second, open and uh, co-creative. That refers to another dimension of engaging and entails that teachers, students and societal uh, partners together design learning, learning materials and learning activities. A process in which each of the partners contributes from their own expertise, experience and ambition. Having been the initiator in uh, teacher education of school university uh, partnerships with collaborative research-based learning communities, this is one I cherish. Next one, the third one, the inclusive stance refers to the need to democratize higher education. Not only to provide opportunities to experience the engagement that comes with being a member of a community, 
but also expand the offerings to those who are not fortunate enough to have access to expensive courses and traveling or to those who work and family life ex excludes them from the traditional programs. Now these three first ones together are totally compatible with our motto, the world needs you. Whether it is to, um, to help create better living conditions or equal rights or uh, peace or a better environment. They are also summed up in our vision of um, education that goes under the title Urban Engaged University. With a student population that increasingly, increasingly has um, or reflects the urban reality, it is necess necessary to develop the kind of education that embraces the opportunities as well as the challenges of the cosmopolitan, multicultural, multilingual and multilayered, socially multilayered uh, society. And then the last one, interdisciplinarity. Many current challenges are so complex that multi-perspective uh, approaches are necessary to find solutions. On the border crossing of different disciplines, there's a lot of learning potential, we think. I'm not sure that all our colleagues in all the different disciplines are already convinced of that. But I'm sure that there is a lot of potential in interdisciplinary education. To conclude, I think Utopia and me might get along. <laughs> We'd better, uh, because it is up to me to further stimulate the integration of um, the learning communities uh, in the existing courses and programs. Um, and as you can see on the next slide, it's, um, it's already impressed. We'll have to tell a lot about what has been and what has yet to come. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you very much, Nadine. I think you passed. The, you passed the first test. Uh, you're in. Uh, so thank you very much for these <laughs> kind words. Uh, I would correct you, actually. It's not a landscape, it's a universe. And you actually uh, presented it as that. And we think of it as a universe um, as well. Uh, because I think uh, looking at it as a landscape somewhat... Do, doesn't do it good, you know, uh, particularly because, as you said, we try to address different values and principles, and even though they're written everywhere, all across the policy documents, rarely they're taken seriously. We actually had a conversation today within the Flex Lab meeting. Uh, it's tough, but we do take it seriously, like solidarity, like inclusivity, and so on. So, um, this is something we try to ingrain in every mechanism uh, we constructed within the work package too, also across different activities that we conduct. Uh, and with this in mind, we try to actually address the key educational challenges of the European higher education area, which, are, which we are supposed to do. So um, it's my great pleasure to pass the floor to my dear friends, Professor Rosette Siegers, representing VUB, uh, <laughs> in her role as Utopia 2050 ed Educational Coordinator, and Professor Joe Anguri from University of Warwick, Curriculum Developer. Uh, Rosette and Joe, or otherwise known as uh, Josette, because um, they're inseparable. Uh, will introduce the floor of Utopia Connected Learning Communities, elaborate on the Utopia education policy and the strategy, and reflect on the initial pilot phase. So please, uh, Rosette, I guess, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. And uh, please forgive a bit from a disequilibrium problem. Uh, physically, I mean, uh, since yesterday, I... Stay uh, on my chair if you allow me to. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is it? 
on? Yeah. Okay. Is it okay? Yeah. 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 Just keep it a little bit closer, I think, to uh, the speak, uh, the source of speak. Um, but well, I'm. I really am touched by seeing all these colleagues, students. I hope also here and there, and guests of the University of Ljubljana to uh, to assist here and 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 listen and 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 talk with us. Uh, on this universe or cosmos or, or whatever we call it uh, of the utopia connected learning. Um, let us start. Yeah, let us start by stating that our approach claims to be innovative but pragmatic at the same time. Uh, we take a threefold approach combining concept building, preparing context, and testing. And I think that those that participated and contributed to these three types of approaches are represented here at the table, but also in, in the room, if, uh, uh, if I perceive it well, because it's a little bit dark uh, <laughs> uh, uh, at the end of the room. What is also, I think, important, and we had another talk, I think, about the importance of minutes or reports and, and, and all these kind of things. But what we did do is that all these processes were documented and presented to the WP2 representatives of all universities during trimestral meetings, thereby allowing to profit from the advice and the backup of the highest authorities in our universities and at the same time, um, uh, sorry, uh, it is especially important for this type of approach of uh, an educational model to do so and to have this interface with uh, our people responsible for curriculum development as a vice director or in similar positions. Because let's not forget, and we will repeat that, I think, in, in many sentences to come uh, in, in, in our speech, that we are cooperating with teaching staff that is there, that is involved in existing programs. And that means, of course, that we have to support them doing this and taking all these responsibilities next to the workload they already have and the responsibilities they already have. So let's briefly look at uh, what then happened in three sub-work packages. In Utopia 2050, um, the money was going to the sub-work packages. I see that in Utopia more, the money is going to the tasks. So we'll, we'll have to be careful because it's a little bit a different kind of approach. But, well, the money is a big word, of course, because we all know that the budgets, although they are impressive when you look at them as, as a total amount, uh, they are not so impressive if you divide this by university and by operational year. So there is not that much money and, and, and we try to use it uh, as, as efficiently as possible. Um, in educational strategy, I told you about the documents and the, the reports related to these support packages. I just want to point out that we had four strategic notes. They are available, uh, that you can consult them. And they were in fact documenting the progress that we made in the, in the different um, stages of, of the development of, of, of the strategy. There was one, yeah at the beginning on the building blocks. Then there was uh, a, a focus on the alignment uh, or the potential alignment uh, with uh, the EU political uh, agenda. We talked about life cycle and sustainability of, of the connected communities. And last but not least, we are now still busy consolidating the value added that has been created in these uh, communities. At the level of the second sub-work packages, uh, which was then facilitating the curriculum, we started from the fact, and it was also already mentioned by Thomas, that higher education is still framed in a complex set of rules. And you can justify this because the uh, higher education institutes respect the national and sub-national legislation relating to, uh, uh, to education. Um, so this resulted in a, two research reports, in fact, on barriers and enablers for uh, 
uh, international cooperation, taking into account this context. We had uh, a first part uh, on facilitating Utopia's curriculum, uh, and it was delivered by uh, Anna Maria Fjellman from the University of Gothenburg. She was comparing the legal context and the inter internal procedures for curriculum building in the partner universities. And then a second uh, uh, report was on the creating a vision, in fact, for internal and external quality systems of European universities in general, but also more specifically for the Utopia and Utopia model. And this was prepared by Thomas himself and by Achim Hobach uh, uh, in the University of La Ljubljana. And last but not least, 30 connected learning communities now operational in a wide range of thematic networks and cross-campus activities and recognizing the efforts of students and uh, teachers, staff involved in these communities. At this stage of the project, we are still having a majority of the communities that are not at the end of their life cycle, that are still expanding. And we can already mention that we have more than 200 staff members and more than 3,000 students directly involved in, in fact, the operations related to these communities. Next to the Utopia 2050 project and in the frame of an Erasmus Key Action 2 call, we also obtained additional funding to test the potential of the connected learning communities for developing an inclusive approach in lifelong learning. We'll come back to that later. So let's look at these building blocks. And the building blocks of Utopia are the so-called Utopia labeled learning units, existing curriculum components, as already said, in academic offering of one or our, of our uh, university members. Identified in three selection rounds, organized in fact in each year of the pilot program that we are now finalizing. By following this approach, we succeeded in creating operating partnerships within the time limits of the pilot project and avoided more lengthy procedures needed for collaborating at program or degree level. And from these learning units, we go then to uh, learning communities and to connected learning communities. <coughs> learning units are responding to the vision of openness already indicated by Nadine and adapted by the Alliance. Learning units literally aim to break down the walls, walls between disciplines, walls between staff and students, walls between academia and society, walls between degree seekers and non-modal type of learners. The teachers responsible for these learning units accept to become the spill of thematic networks or learning communities that work across campuses on curricular offerings, but also on joining research practice and trying to have an um, optimal impact on society. The connected learning community's development comes in different stages. We start, of course, and this is not an easy task, to select and identify the leads and partners in an, each new cohort of learning communities that were started up each academic year in the three years that we have been, uh, that we had as a time horizon for the pilot program. We then later go to exploring the potential of the community for connecting and sharing resources. And this leads then to the testing and development of cross-campus learning activities involving students, teachers, and stakeholders during two uh, sub uh, sub how do you say this? Uh, consecutive uh, 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 academic years. And then, of course, in the end, and we are still doing that for the first round, in fact, as we speak, consolidating the value added that has been created in these uh, uh, communities and giving it a more sustainable life. These different stages will become more clear when 
uh, Joe takes the floor. And before giving her the floor, I want to say that all these stages were facilitated by a central team, and that's not only Joe, although she was the lead of, of, uh, of the central curriculum team. We also want to explicitly refer to the role of Karen Triquin, uh, who is in fact monitoring and documenting the process and the progress in each community, and Tommy Kenne, who is in fact enabling us and teaching us how to use collaborative learning platforms to in fact yeah, enable people to cooperate and uh, this in a continuous basis and not only in the few face-to-face -face meetings that were accorded to us during Utopia Weeks. But first tell us, Joe, <laughs> taking into account the impact of education on our lives and knowing that important changes in our sector have to be backed by needs, changing needs in society. Why is this in fact a good time for working on connectedness? Thank you, Rosette. So first of all, I'll find a spot to position myself so I can see you and the slides are not being the way. So um, thanks very much. So yes, why, why now? Uh, it's a really very important question and where, what we started uh, and to, to sort of the journey we started and what we are really very much see as the benefit uh, of having the power of a utopia is certainly not uh, one project or even many projects, is really to think differently, to reimagine what our uh, higher education can do, how we could reconfigure both uh, all our activity, our teaching, learning, uh, research, uh, societal impact. Now, um, this is fundamental uh, because uh, we are, need, we need to do, universities need to do a lot in a context of change. And uh, those of you who were in the morning in the Flex Lab meeting or you heard us talking about lifelong learning, of course, there we reflect a lot about the fact that we really need to think who is the student. Uh, but that's not only in terms of the conversation on lifelong learning or flexible learning. Uh, we are well beyond the time where we can think the student as uh, the model students coming out of secondary education, spending five to seven years with us uh, without any financial constraints, uh, and then jumping into the job market in some fairly stable world. Uh, so we know that this is, not, uh, the, this is not the profile. We know that the profile of our students are changing. Uh, we know that the relationship between our universities, the region, the national, the international uh, environment needs to change. Uh, and therefore, it's really an opportunity to use the power of the Alliance to be more than the sum of our parts in what we do. So uh, we have also a number of resilient barriers. Uh, this, all the words that we've used and the concepts and the terms have been around for a very long time. Uh, and the, 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 the benefits uh, and the privilege we have by working together is reminding ourselves how many times we have attempted projects that were really trying to bring change. And we had what I often refer to as uh, educational fireworks. So some great, uh, fantastic idea, some good project that touches the lives of a few students or some of our researchers and always remains a sort of in the periphery. What we really need is to work on how we can actually bring this periphery to the mainstream and how we can go beyond binaries. So binaries are political, are divisive. We can't, we don't have the luxury of thinking in either or. We really need a, a different model to go beyond uh, the traditional learner and the lifelong learning, the research and the education, the online, the offline, uh, the mobile, the non-mobile. We really need to think of learning experience experiences, learning activities. We really need to think of the relationships that we build between our universities and the actual value-add 
reminded of transnational collaboration. So what we really have with the Utopia and what we try to do with the learning communities is a journey. I'm going to talk about the journey in a minute, but it is a journey that would enable us to navigate those very troubled waters of universities operating in a, in, in, in a landscape where we're not and should not be the sole providers of training. We have uh, geopolitical change uh, and don't worry, just, yeah, it's fine. I'll, I'll, move, I'll move to that slide in a minute. Uh, and uh, also uh, to actually really rethink how we can provide opportunity. Inclusion, everybody, everybody in this room, everybody wants inclusion. How do we translate this into the daily experience of everybody, our students, our colleagues, our non-academic partners, unless we have something that would enable us to translate this work in a pragmatic way, we will deliver another educational firework. And that's certainly not why we are in this room today. So, so we, what we set out to achieve, that was a journey of connectivity and connectedness. Uh, and in order to achieve educational change, uh, we need strong relationships uh, and we need to actually have a strong foundation, which did, we did not have when we started. We, we haven't had the experience of working together. And at the same time, what we also wanted was to not focus and concentrate all our effort uh, in uh, designing something that would touch the lives of some students, but would think of a ways where we can build on what we already do well. And where a partnership of great institutions where there is a lot of good work, there is a lot of success stories. And what we wanted to do is to uh, provide opportunities to connect. And we draw on that sort of on the connected learning communities. Uh, we built the model we took, and uh, some of you in this room, you've uh, been in talks before we presented the pyramid, so I'm going to examine you in a minute. Uh, so, um, giving you a little bit of time. Uh, but uh, they're sort of for those of you who are new, uh, we draw on connected pedagogies, so approaches that enable all the core stakeholders to connect, to transcend uh, the boundaries uh, of one program, one discipline discipline, uh, one university, and so on. Now, connected learning and opportunities for the learner to connect uh, the, uh, the, the sort of with either peers or with other groups are not new. They're not always come under this umbrella term, but they have been around, and colleagues who come from education sciences, they would have seen connected learning taking different guises over the years. Uh, and uh, group to group, uh, and that's why it is a journey, actually really a springboard, uh, just the sort of the previous one for a minute. Uh, so it was actually a, a tool and a springboard to really provide those time for relationships to be established uh, and also to grow. Now, uh, learning communities are, of course, have provided a lot and we will hear um, some great examples today. And we will also, it's an opportunity for us all as we're about to embark on the new journey, the continuation of the journey with the Utopia more to think how we build uh, on the success, how we build on what we've achieved, and we can move into further integration. Because what we wanted from the start was to create this dynamic learning ecosystem uh, where we actually bring together all our domains of activity. We bring together our teaching and learning, our research, uh, our impact work, and uh, everything becomes co-constitutive as actually it really is in reality. So so uh, the learning community was represented by the pyramid, uh, if we move to the next slide, uh, which uh, is something that uh, uh, if you escaped it, I don't know how you manage that. Uh, we very much try to use it as a visual metaphor. Uh, and what we're trying to actually show here is how the learning uh, units that uh, Rosette described, how they were selected to become the seed, the conduit, the mechanism for uh, really building together groups of people, groups of colleagues, groups of students who would, over a very short period of time, and by identifying organic ways of connecting on the basis of existing practice, develop a community. And by bringing together a group of experts, we don't have a community, we have a group of experts. So developing communities means developing relationships. Relationships take time. So we, very, very, we first start by getting to know each other, uh, and then we decide whether we want to commit or not. That's how it goes. We first have to flirt, uh, and then we have to decide whether we actually decide to commit further or not. And 
that was actually what we tried to do. It was to facilitate that process on the basis of existing good practice and add value. And that work was in the context of a huge disruption in the sector uh, where everything had to shift uh, online overnight. And that actually was a, 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 a sort of, that, that gave us the drive for, for really rethinking and challenging ourselves because we ourselves wanted to achieve the aims that we've covered already, but the way that we were using modalities, the way we were using online, offline, transnational collaboration and so on, were very much in the reality of using physical mobility for quite a lot of the work that we had to translate into an online environment, thinking of digital literacy in a completely different way and so forth. So what this pyramid shows was how the, the, the foundation level of the pyramid, which is what we often refer to as the micro level, is where we find the components, the curriculum elements, uh, those sort of parts of, of our activities, our daily practices, that by sharing and by creating a sort of openness, we actually find how we could enrich. Uh, and that took different formats, so our communities very quickly found that in the world where we actually had to record everything, we had to produce and curate resources for online delivery, we had to bring and rethink how we actually uh, engage our students uh, in online seminars and so on, was actually really an opportunity to open up and, and connect them uh, with their peers uh, in, at the utopia level. And although it took different formats in different communities, and we'll hear some examples very soon, and some students uh, had a sort of shorter and others had longer experience, everybody who has worked uh, in the context of establishing university alliances would know that it takes a very long time for uh, the alliance to translate to educational offerings that touch and become relevant to the lives uh, of students across disciplines, across departments. And that was something that actually was hugely, hugely powerful. And what we saw was that this life cycle went very fast. So our communities within months established very, very strong connections, established commitments that then morphed into new other activities, new research, new seminars, new opportunities for thinking differently on pedagogy pedagogic offering, and we are now where we are, where we also have communities that design or co-create uh, different programs and so on. So on the basis of creating and spending and allowing time to create what we did not have, which was relationships, it's not that we did not have programs, we did not have a strong set of relationships and experiences of our students to think of themselves as a utopia being part of their, of, of their experience, as being part of the, the, what they get by being a student in one of our institutions, we were able to also offer a whole range of learning activities that enriched their experience and actually provide them opportunities to work with peers uh, and work with colleagues and work with a range of stakeholders uh, from across the alliance. Uh, then that sort of the foundation level moves us to the meso level, which is uh, where we uh, more or less are. Uh, and this is where we actually see those activities growing uh, and moving out of the context of one unit or of one program or of one department and taking the formats that then invite and involve students across uh, the institution, across other parts of the institution. And of course, this uh, takes different guises depending on the discipline, but we actually saw a number of student centers, student-run events that actually very quickly the students themselves brought into the offering. And that is the aspiration is that we're moving towards establishing an open and flexible curriculum, not by actually creating a different curriculum, but by actually building pathways into utopia at different stages. So transnational collaboration and mobility is not something that happens at one particular stage of a student life cycle, but it's something that has different opportunities and different ways uh, and different experiences so that students can engage in different ways uh, during their time with us. So moving on very quickly, because I don't want to spend longer, that was a sort of way that uh, also helped us to organize our own thinking and also helped us uh, start working and, and we acknowledge the work of uh, the curriculum team 
it's absolutely invaluable and we need to recognize the amazing work that colleagues did across the institution. We work with over 200, 250 colleagues. That's a huge number of colleagues who somehow contributed to this really important this, this, this architecture that we're sharing today. So it was really, and it is really, a collective achievement that deserves to grow and to be supported because we had uh, the effort of students and colleagues who saw the potential uh, and really worked to bring and embed this work into their offering. So it takes different guises, and then if we move on to the next um, a slide, what we actually have here, uh, and we are going to see this uh, in practice when uh, colleagues here are going to share their journey, is that our communities develops a whole range, a portfolio of activities, uh, which uh, was established very quickly, starting from the sort of the foundation level of our pyramid. So you actually see the shared resources that, uh, of course, COVID uh, has been an accelerant there, uh, and, and of course, that's something that that in a sense it's a bank uh, of resource, that it, it is the asset of communities that now they have this really valuable asset that all colleagues involved can actually use and continue curating and grow. Uh, to joint activities, uh, to cross-campus assignments uh, that actually took different formats. So we're going to hear about cross-campus work uh, that took the sort of the form of summer and winter programs. Uh, we're going to hear about activities that are running as we speak, uh, and they have enormous complexity, but despite that, colleagues and students see the value added, and that actually really shows how we can can, together, if we identify how to connect, we can really deliver the scale that we cannot do individually. And that from the start is something that is really important because one of the challenges is that we need to deliver and we need to actually, we are in this moment uh, where policymakers, national and international policymakers, encourage higher education to really think differently. But we also know that there is a shrinking of resource. There are uh, our colleagues and ourselves and everybody stretched uh, and thinking and adding innovation when it is something that is different to what we already do requires resource and requires the collaboration uh, of a number of stakeholders who don't have the capacity. What we actually wanted to do, and I think we have seen how much a model that starts from building innovation from within, building and adding value, and sort of uh, we're going to talk about that more uh, later on, really gives us this mosaic, this gives us this uh, really different universe back to how that now translates from where we are with a sort of set and a portfolio of diverse learning activities that are there and they exist and they grow and it's a living lab that we're all experiencing, how we have an opportunity to think of our own policy framework, to really think of how we actually really create uh, an ecosystem where this work uh, will continue growing and deliver the value added that we want. And I'm going to uh, pass on back to Rosette to continue the journey. I think we can skip this one, Joe, because most of the things have been uh, dealt with in, in, in what we said before. So let's have a look. Uh, you now more or less understand what the context is uh, uh, of, of our model and, and, and how it can, of course, inspire um, uh, the policy uh, needed for sustaining it and for, uh, for supporting it. The um, uh, first thing that I would like to stress is that we feel that the alignment with uh, the, the agenda of the European higher education uh, in, in the Commission uh, has proved to be an important advantage for continued support accorded also to Utopia More and to the, uh, to the, continue, uh, to the continued uh, possibilities for Utopia. Connected learning communities really reduce the barriers for international cooperation through connecting innovative uh, teaching practices and reinforcing the existing drive, the already existing drive in the operational core of our universities. All CLC, sorry, all CLC are uh, challenge driven and inspired by stakeholders in society. So that means in fact that our approach helps to link 
uh, educational policies to other types of European policies. Huh? Research and innovation, digitalization, employment, we gave examples of, 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 of these links. One of our core ambitions is to uh, reach out or to allow students to reach or to um, experience an international, an international outreach um, and uh, make it possible for them to combine this with other responsibilities for family and work. So that's for us embracing diversities. These four, uh, let's say, uh, topics, European collaboration, societal engagement, policy coordination, and embrace diversity, I think we have a good score uh, for, for supporting that by, by our approach. Of course, we want Utopia's education model to become more than an experiment. It was already expressed, I think, here uh, a number of times. And that means that in the consolidation phase of the first round communities, we started, of course, already looking to identify pathways for sustainability. And a, a variety of pathways have, al of pathways have already uh, been, been uh, in fact, identified. There is, of course, the possibilities for integrating the results of the connected uh, activities in existing academic offerings. There is also using the connectedness established in the partnerships by uh, and for the development of European programs. And last but not least, we will try to valorize the network more and more in non-curriculum related activities, such as research and innovation, and we hope that in Utopia More, this integrated approach will be, in fact, the dominant, uh, uh, the dominant focus of, of, of new activities. This goes, of course, with a coherent internal policy to support all that. We need to find the good ways and even stronger incentives for recognizing and validating the efforts of staff and students in these, uh, in these communities. We need continued support also for the incorporation of the value added once that the communities have in fact reached the maturity phase of their life cycle. And last but not least, we need to link the Utopia communities to ongoing curriculum development and ongoing portfolio activities for research and innovation. The tools of such a coherent internal policy are covering on the one hand separate needs, but they are also triggering one another. And that's in fact what we try to show here in the visual. In other words, our advice is in fact to stop dealing with Utopia on a project basis, but making it an, integr an, integrated, uh, an, in an integrated, I will come to it, an integrated component of our strategies. Back to you, Joe. So the last, so that gets us to the end uh, almost of where we are at today, certainly not the end of the journey. In some ways, it feels that we identified a vehicle and we identified a pathway. We identified ways to really build uh, relationships and to very fast move into exceeding the aim uh, of delivering uh, sort of change within one particular part of our institutions, but we have an opportunity and we identified ways and tools to really build innovation and change on the basis of what we do well. And we know that uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, experience in delivering across the whole range of our activities and by connecting where we have this organic ways, this organic nodes is where we are actually really stronger than what we can actually other ways do individually. And therefore, what is actually really relevant now is that uh, we have a moment. Education has a moment, and I refer to education as the totality of higher education. And there is a opportunity really to hold our policy makers accountable to the uh, and to, to the actual um, 
encouragement uh, and also uh, a strong uh, positioning on the need for education change by working with us on how we can really use the policy tools that we have to think differently in terms of our relationship with the national regulators, to think differently in terms of what we want uh, transnational collaboration to look like and to deliver. So Utopia is really uh, part of a very good ecosystem. It's part of the European University Alliance and aspiration to actually really in the current policy context, uh, reach and, and take momentum really and capitalize on what what we can do, not with new tools, because every one of the single tools and every one of the experiences has been around for a long time. What has not been around for a long time uh, is the current uh, conditions, the circumstances, the disruption of the pandemic, uh, the uh, fast pace of change, uh, the geopolitical changes that force us to think differently, uh, the real uh, momentum uh, and that, that, that we actually have in Europe in particular. There is really a European moment that I think we should all uh, capitalize on and to really bring that system where a utopia the European University Alliance is the policy context would enable us to really redefine our offering offer global learning actually think in a different way about what we've been talking about at least all my life, ever since I started at least my sort of PhD. I remember about the sort of parity of esteem between teaching and learning. I've always been a senior researcher whenever I'm in those in those in my world of uh, research councils and so on nobody still asks me about educational leadership when that happens typically it's not in the sort of in the frame of, of seeing it as a necessarily positive when I'm in my educational world there are many many colleagues who don't know what my research is about so we still have quite a lot of silos that we actually have been recognizing but we haven't had a model and we didn't have a different approach to really think differently. And the same goes with lifelong learning and impact. We really need to bring those together because they're not separate. They've never been separate and we don't have the luxury of keeping them as separate parts of our activities. So what we actually really want to do, and that's the last um, before passing on uh, to Tomas. I believe, uh, is to actually really uh, visit the actual aspiration that we had where this cone really is aiming to show how we move in our thinking from the pyramid to the cone uh, and where actually we want to bring the different components of connectedness and that involves connected learning, it involves uh, connecting uh, activities that are already in place in our learning, in connecting activity, uh, it's which then m makes connected research and connecting learning, not being separate CLCs and CRCs. This is the starting point because this is where we are at. This is how our universities operate. But we're moving towards uh, the Utopia connected communities, the Utopia ecosystem, where we have an Utopia campus where societal and academic impact are actually the center because relevance of what we do is really fundamental and then that also enable us to have a reconfiguration of teaching, learning, research, and all the relationship of the core stakeholders involved in the delivery uh, of uh, the whole range of higher education activities. And I'm going to stop and thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Josette, I guess uh, you basically revealed why you're inseparable. Um, and uh, since I don't want to waste time to, uh, for our learning communities who are going to present themselves, I, I'll preserve a bit of time. So I'm going to briefly go through something we actually already talked about, like diversity of approaches. Obviously, we're different institutions operating within different contexts, different regulation. Uh, and this is something we knew from the start. So this is why we also talked about a lot at the beginning about the barriers and enablers. And then also talked about strategies, how to overcome these barriers and work on or in a way strengthen the enablers. 
and uh, I'm going to briefly present how we did it at the University of Ljubljana, because I guess every partner shares a totally different story, or could share a different story, and I guess this is also uh, um, a declaration of how the model allows diverse approaches, diversity I itself. Uh, please, Mansa. So what we did before we go to the presentation of two communities here today, uh, we obviously wanted to attract a lot of attention for this innovative model, but it's, it's hard, yeah, it's hard. Uh, but at the same time, we've been successful, because if you remember, I, I think Rosette remembers, because uh, when we delivered a list of over 50 names for the first five, six, for the first six learning communities, it was a nightmare for Rosette. So I guess our teachers um, and researchers recognize the opportunity, uh, recognize the, well, the potential of this innovation to actually spill over also into their everyday practice. And what we did was, at the end of the day, after three years now, today, we have teachers, professor, so professors, researchers, and uh, students involved in 24 out of 30 uh, communities. We lead five of them. Uh, there are approximately, we don't want to monitor, even though I'm frequently portrayed as a bureaucrat. I uh, <laughs> uh, did not uh, try to monitor our teachers um, uh, about what they do, uh, who does it, uh, and uh, to what impact, we will see. And I guess this is a beneficial approach because uh, the output is way better and way more exciting that we initially, at least I and uh, uh, my colleagues at the University of Ljubljana have anticipated. Uh, so it makes sense to trust people. Yeah? And it's a trust-based model also, the model we're talking about. So there are like approximately 29 teachers actively participating in the first two rounds of 18 learning communities with their students and other colleagues. So the ecosystem is way larger. Uh, and in the third round, we had also uh, 15 new uh, incoming teachers. And also here, the demand was uh, huge. Uh, and we actually had to filter the colleagues also at our institutional level because the colleagues at the view B didn't want to have um, none of it. So basically, we had to do that, even though it was hard, because basically we're, we're mostly running on motivation, it's, and it's crucial actually to support it. So the involvement, next slide, please. Yeah, so what we did, I, I'm gonna briefly go through it. We took advantage of the funding fully, uh, and we actually added, uh, something that was that's actually a help from the ministry to support uh, the European alliances, uh, Euro European university alliances, and we use that developmental fund to support our learning communities. And within the new model, this is going to be the bulk of it. So we're going to use our own resources, which were also very well programmed by the national ministry because it has seen the potential of those units and we will support that. Uh, even though, as Rosette, you said, the money is scarce, but uh, we're finding ways to actually find it in order to support our colleagues. Currently, the leading ones have 0.5 FTE per unit uh, equivalent of the teaching assistant. So basically, it's not a lot of money. It's like 15,000 euros, something like that. Uh, but nevertheless, I, yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and, and it's actually a recognition. I think that, that's the message. It's the recognition. We know that our colleagues are spending way more time um, uh, investing in, into those communities. They're actually adding extra endeavors, extra, extra activities. And this is why we do it, because it sends a message. And 
um, yeah, what we also did now, with the help of the ministry, and I guess wise programming at the side of the university, uh, we also have a permanent fund for uh, different activities um, uh, organized within the learning communities. So if there are uh, additional activities emerging, we're supporting them at least uh, with taking care of like traveling accommodation and other consumables, because uh, it's important, right? Uh, and the next slide, and this is the final slide. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, what we uh, already, what I already talked about, it was crucial from the start for us to actually support this curriculum co-design. Now, I've been a part of uh, BFUG teaching and learning uh, group um, that prepares like the, the, the um, communicate for the ministers. We've seen like uh, in my term, we've seen several stories of curricular co-design, but in fact, there was no co-design. Uh, particularly when it um, involved, when, when you look at students and the way they're involved, other stakeholders, it's actually between us, between the professors, between the academics. So this is why this was already at the start very crucial for us, because it actually is ingrained in the core, into the core of the model. And um, what we think and we, we do see and we will see uh, with the presentation of our colleagues, that we're basically actually going further than the opportunities all, already allowed or already supported by different programs. Now we do cherish them, absolutely. Uh, but I think we're on a verge of systemic support to doing something else, something more. Uh, by not replacing that, but just adding additional value in order also for those activities to spill over our own institutional daily lives to a greater extent. So what we've seen is that the international recognition of individuals, even though it's a, an educational collaboration, is getting higher. So basically people are recognizing this even though it's not research, it's not like it's not web of science, it's not impact factor, it's still recognized. Uh, and obviously what we are uh, particularly um, happy about is that it just opened up a new space for collaboration which actually is very evident and uh, brings results also if we measure them uh, on the basis of the traditional indicators, like money, points, publications. It makes sense, it makes sense. And this is why uh, I think we, um, we uh, well, the university made the correct decision to actually uh, step up uh, its participation in this alliance, also with its, um, well, allocated for development of the university itself. So now, not to waste time, as I said, I'm trying to preserve it. I preserved, I guess, some eight minutes. Uh, I'm pleased to have representatives from two learning communities from University of Ljubljana today. Um, the first is uh, prof Associate Professor Vasya Rant, and the second is Assistant Professor Natasha Hirschi. Hirschi. Sorry, um, with their, I was wondering about that, uh, with their students. Uh, so they will briefly, but uh, not so briefly, uh, present their work and describe the perspective from the field, so from the community themselves. Um, and obviously the colleagues, students will actually add the perspective we're sometimes forgetting about. Uh, and this is why it's important actually to also see that perspective because this is something I already talked about the curriculum co-design. So um, first let me give the floor to Vasya, uh, who has been a partner of the European the World Learning Community since the first round. Uh, when the first six learning communities started in uh, 2019 and uh, Brigitta, student of that community. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to share my experience and also that of Professor Moemir Mrak because we co cooperated uh, in a lot of these uh, activities together. 
uh, within the learning community Europe in the world. So we heard a lot today about the universe of learning units, learning communities, uh, shared experiences, uh, connectivity, innovative activities and so on. Uh, so let me try to show you some of the planets or stars within this universe so that you will know what we're talking about here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to present basically two activities that we did uh, uh, within the uh, School of Economics and Business that are quite different as planets are different so these two activities are different as well. Mm -hmm. So the first activity is uh, was actually a simulation exercise which was built on my and also Moimir's extensive experience in EU budget negotiations, the actual budget negotiations. So we built a virtual simulation of neg negotiations about the multi-annual EU budget within the European Council. Uh, this was an activity that was held in 2021. Uh, so this was still in the midst of the COVID crisis. Uh, so it was held completely online. Uh, and uh, this activity was something that was new. It was actually uh, a value-adding activity that did not exist before. That's why we also accredited it uh, with the University of Ljubljana as a co-curricular activity uh, with four ECTS points. Then uh, we uh, implemented a lot of promotional activities. We prepared a flyer. We announced and advertised the activity uh, both within the learning community as well as uh, on the Utopia website and uh, through the partner universities, the initial partners in the Utopia project. Uh, we also prepared uh, an extensive scenario of the simulation. It was, by the way, really interesting because the negotiations themselves for this particular period, as the 2021-27 period, were interrupted by the COVID crisis. So we made a scenario that started before the COVID crisis. Uh, we had a newsroom for the students. So we, we basically put them into the shoes of the politicians in 2019, actually, right? So before the COVID crisis, just when the European Green Deal came out and so on. And then we slowly progressed uh, and uh, also through the newsroom, you know, uh, we we um, presented different uh, articles, uh, background materials which the students had to study uh, and fully immerse them in this environment, right? So this scenario was made and then also additionally, uh, the whole simulation was run online on the learning management system uh, canvas that we use at the School of Economics and Business. Uh, we collected the applications uh, with the help of our partners, uh, many thanks to uh, each one of them, uh, and then made a final selection. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, in all, 38 students applied, uh, and out of these, 27 fully participated in the simulation, so it was quite a high uh, participation rate. Uh, keep in mind, these activities was held in the summer, so students had much better things to do than sit behind the screen, but still 27 of them fully participated. So we did in these negotiations. Uh, we gave them substantial background reading materials and created, I would say, well, uh, Brigitta will be able to say that better afterwards, uh, a fully immersive negotiating environment, you know, full with the backgrounds, as you will see, uh, with the flags and everything. So they really could step into the role of, uh, of the negotiators. Yeah. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so what they had to do, so what was, were the deliverables uh, from the students? So they had to prepare negotiating positions as well as other outputs for uh, three rounds of negotiations. So uh, the actual live negotiations were held. Uh, we had uh, four sessions. Uh, the first introductory session where we basically represented the logic of, of the exercise, and then three rounds of live negotiations, which simulated the European Council negotiations, both uh, on the plenary, in a plenary and as well as bilateral setting, just as they are done in reality. And at the end, the teams also worked towards drafting European Council conclusions based on the negotiating docu documents and we gave them real negotiating documents to which we had access and at that time they were already publicly available. 
for the participation, students received a certificate of participation and were awarded for ECTS. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so now I'll here show you some of the exhibits of all the preparatory work that went into, so you see on the left, <laughs> the flyer, the briefing note, emails that were sent to the students. Let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, this was the Canvas website, so it was quite graphical and instructive to use. Uh, they could, uh, they, uh, there were also instructions for how to use this website, and in the next slide, we'll be able to see how the negotiations actually worked. So this was the plenary session uh, of the European Council. As you see, many students really uh, stepped into the role with the backgrounds. It was optional, we didn't force them to use it, but uh, many of them did, right? Uh, next. Uh, these were bilateral meetings uh, here. We also have Professor Moimir Marak, who probably would be here today if he wasn't uh, teaching. Uh, so uh, let's go to the next slide. This is the uh, certificate of participation that uh, they received uh, at the end. Uh, next slide, please. And some impressions. So I will rest silent here a little bit. You can read by yourselves, but as you can see, uh, students were quite impressed by what we did. So I think this was really a high value adding activity, but as Joe said before, you know, like it was like a, uh, fireworks, you know, um, once uh, in a lifetime or so to speak. But as you will see, we are now trying to build on that. So we're trying uh, to, you know, make it sustainable uh, into the going into the future. Eh? Can we go to the next slide? Uh, yeah, so it's a high value etiquette activity, uh, a positive experience also for us as professors. It was really fun doing this actually, and uh, you know, teaching and learning, it's best when it's fun, right? So when it's, uh, yeah. Uh, but at the same time, it was also a high workload also for us. Believe me, we did a lot, a lot of background work to make this uh, uh, come true, right? Uh, the problem is that this activity at the time was not embedded in an existing, uh, let's say, course or activities that we do at the School of Economics and Business. Uh, so its sustainability was questionable. We discussed this in our learning community meetings a lot of times. However, uh, the School of Economics has now taken steps to further integrate this activity into the curriculum in two ways. First of all, we, have, uh, we are building uh, an interdisciplinary program with the uh, uh, biotech uh, biotechnical faculty, uh, where one of the courses will have this as a module. So that's one option. The other option is we just, and that's just from the last tenet, uh, we confirmed uh, this extracurricular activity students will be able to choose it. So uh, in that way, in the future, it might become more sustainable. But there still is a problem that um, uh, we have limited human resources, right? So if we do this, then we have to cut back on some other teaching. We cannot do it all, right? Uh, I think this is, can you move on to the next slide? I think this is the last one from the first activity. Uh, that's the second one. So I think th this should be the point where I hand, uh, uh, you know, the microphone to my student, Brigitta Petek, who participated in this simulation exercise. Yeah. Uh, by the way, in this simulation, uh, there were students from all the, uh, from all the participating uh, universities. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so what can I say? That we learned a lot, definitely. Uh, that we had fun doing it, absolutely. That role-playing and presenting and negotiating starting points and uh, accepting compromises will also benefit this uh, in the future in our chosen career field, without a doubt. Uh, that um, we are more of a public speaker, I don't know, maybe <laughs> another simulation or two and might do the trick. Uh, that the simulation was really well prepared and that Professor Rand and Professor Mark chose a really good tactic of not uploading all the documentation right away, but gradually, so... Um, build up the <laughs> <laughs> um, So, um, 
uh, the bottom line, we worked hard, we learned a lot, we had um, fun. Um, but for me, um, as a child born into a single parent with a minimum wage, it's also a much more important um, goal of Utopia um, that it builds on non-formal education that's available to all, regardless of the financial status. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think Brigitta made a very important point about the, the importance of uh, inclusiveness uh, of these activities. Uh, now, I can also show the second one if we have time, but I don't want to uh, cut into the time of my... Uh, yeah, so, because I see Tomas already <laughs> jumping there. Yeah. yeah, so I'll hand it over. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Vasya and Brigitta. Um, sorry for that, uh, but it's true. Actually, I received a call from Joe like two or three years ago, uh, and she said, look, we have to support this. We have to support this, because Vasya and Moimir were partners of the community, and the amount of work you actually allocated into this activity was such that it was visible, well, from the, from the universe, actually. Uh, and first, Warwick and then Ljubljana. So thank you for your contribution to this as well. And thank you, Brigitta. So now, the last presenters today uh, are Professor Natasha Hirzi. Uh, with her is also a professor of that learning community, uh, Professor Agnes Pisansky, and a colleague, I'm sorry, it's Florian, yeah, it's, on, it's the correct one, uh, and Florian, who's actually also contributing to the other, um, well, mainly support activities that are crucial for the community. They are a part of the um, learning community from the second round, text and discourse analysis, and they are the leaders of uh, learning community on behalf of the uh, University of Ljubljana. So, Natasha, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for these kind introductory words. And um, I have to say it's a great opportunity to present what we do here at the learning community. So uh, first things first. So you can see learning community on text and discourse analysis, um, which is something that uh, quite a few people know about but do very little on, right? However, you know that speaking is something that we do all the time and spoken communication is predominant nowadays. So perhaps just briefly, I I could tell you a few things about our learning community if we go to our main goals. First slide, please. Um, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to promote collaboration both between the students and the educators alike. And obviously, we may start with uh, multilingual communication across the utopia, but uh, perhaps later on we could take it further. Why not? Um, what we did was, over the first few sessions, we were just trying to see how we could promote these activities where our students would be involved and have them actively participate. And obviously, during the pandemic, it, there was no other way but to do it online. And we continue working in that framework. However, we're hoping that perhaps in the future we, this may change. I believe it would be a fantastic opportunity for the students to get together also uh, person to person. So um, we're encouraging the development of our students both uh, discourse and language skills and putting them into practice. And last but not least, of course, trying to celebrate our linguistic diversity. Just very briefly about the team. Yes, it's uh, Ljubljana, but there are uh, four other universities participating. So we have colleagues, excellent colleagues um, uh, from uh, uh, Brussels, Paris, Warwick and Barcelona working with us. It's a wonderful group of people and I'm really pleased to say that uh, this opportunity is not only an opportunity for the students to participate but also to collaborate across um, the Utopia collaborative framework with our colleagues from um, our partner states. So. Um, last but not least, that 0.5 FTE, that's our Florian. I'm very pleased to say that he is an invaluable asset to our project, and without him, I have no idea how we could just proceed. 
Okay, if we go on, um, so what are we trying to do? We're trying to provide some sort of a, what shall we call it? Perhaps um, linguistic cafe or language cafe. What does that mean? I don't know if you've ever been involved in anything similar, uh, but we're trying to offer our students a platform where they can get together and communicate in a variety of different languages, because here we're talking about language students as well as translation studies students, who uh, we encourage to get together and communicate in a variety of different languages. So basically, we try to facilitate their interaction in all the languages that actually all these experts that uh, uh, I presented earlier uh, are engaged in. So we offer communication options for them in French, German, Spanish, Italian, as well as English, of course. And we do so um, by actually bringing them together online so that they can put their theoretical knowledge on text and discourse analysis also into practice. So um, spoken interaction is the key word, I assume, or key words in, for that matter. If we go on. How do we do it? We actually, it took quite a while actually for the team to come up with a particular framework that would work. And since this was done over the pandemic, uh, we had to do it online. Um, the teaching staff had to meet online and there were a few challenges associated with that as well because obviously trying to find the time when everyone has enough time to get together, even for the teacher is challenging, let alone for the students, right? Um, we do this so that we bring the students together within the framework of what we refer to as the Languages in Use Week. And this is done twice a year. One is scheduled in March and the other one is, no uh, is November. And yes, right now, this very moment, our students are getting together, collaborating uh, in this uh, project. What does that mean? That we bring the students together from all the partner universities and they get together, um, communicating, interacting on a variety of different topics that may be perhaps challenging for them. Um, they are given several topics uh, from our side, but actually can also come up with their own ideas of what they would like to discuss. Um, it could be anything related to the student life or challenges related to the curricular activities they have to do at their respective universities. And um, their conversations are then recorded, which means that we're, and, uh, we're actually really trying to build up a corpus of these recordings of spoken discourse, which can later on be used for a variety of different purposes, of course, obviously also for research purposes on uh, text and discourse analysis. And this will be available in form of a corpus of spoken discourse. Here we're talking about L2, so we're talking about language students, so they're practicing their L2 skills. Uh, of all these different language varieties that will be available for research um, to all the partners first and then we'll see perhaps also to other communities. So our learning community um, gives our students a chance to meet either one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. We figured out that small groups of three to four might be best because then the students feel that there's a little bit less pressure on them rather than just when you're doing it one-on-one -on -one when they tend to get stuck a little bit because, you know, if you're meeting someone for the very first time, what do you talk about? Okay, yes, the weather, what else? Uh, okay, it's really tough, you know, the student life sucks because uh, it's very difficult to survive this pandemic uh, period. And then what? So we do give them some guidelines, what they can actually talk about, but very quickly, that's just the basics and then they really take off and, and they do it um, on their own. Um, these recordings um, are done via the Microsoft Teams. This is something that the students are very familiar with, uh, had to get familiar with, obviously. Zoom could have been another option or any of these platforms. Um, so as these recordings are then put together, they're compiled into a corpus, this will be available uh, for both the students and the teachers to work on for any research purposes. Um, the languages uh, that I mentioned are actually always an option, so how do we do that? We actually, before um, the event takes place, we encourage the students to uh, register for the event. Next slide, please. Um, and can we have the next one as well, and then come back to this one? 
Thank you. So this is our promotional flyers. The students are given some ideas, basic ideas, what the project is all about. And then they register online. We're trying to elicit some information from the students on their linguistic background, the level of uh, their language knowledge, as well as also which languages they would like to practice. So um, some of the students end up actually practicing more than just one language. It could be English. English seemed to be the preferred one at the moment, but actually the students from the University of Warwick are encouraged, for instance, to um, practice their French skills, right? Um, and they can actually sign up for any of the time slots available. Um, as they register, they're also given a chance to um, enter their own preferred schedule uh, in form of a Padlet, where they actually also can put down some ideas of what they would like to discuss with their colleagues. So there can be certain topics or themes that uh, this, these small groups may wish to engage in in a particular way. Okay, as I said before, one is underway at the moment. So we have, at the beginning of the week, we have an introductor, uh, introduction um, to the entire event. And during this session, the introductory session is dedicated to uh, some rules of behavior online and stuff like that, but also trying to encourage the students to really be there on time so that their colleagues are not waiting for them. Um, and then over the week, they practice all these language skills. Um, at the end of the week on Friday, Fridays. Fridays reserved for the feedback session, where we actually have some evaluation going on, asking students what they enjoyed most or enjoyed least over this particular um, event. And we try to learn from that and then take it a step further. At the moment, we're working only with BA students, but we would really like to engage the MA level as well. Perhaps, you know, the, the, um, the more serious approach to research skills of the MA level students might be something to take into consideration and that's where we see place for uh, improving in terms of trying to embedding this activity into our regular uh, curriculum because it's rather difficult to actually do that. Um, I didn't really mean to talk about the challenges but perhaps just one or two. If you cannot embed any of these uh, activities into a regular curriculum, there may not be as much interest into pursuing these ideas uh, as perhaps one would have hoped for. Um, nevertheless, if we go just to the last slide, I don't want to keep you too long. This is one student testimony from the very last evaluation session. That's what one of the students said. I truly enjoyed this opportunity. It was incredible as an experience and I would love to do it again. Even if this were to be every term, this would be something that I would love to do. One happy panther. I hope many more to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natasha, um, Agnes, and Florian. Uh, now, um, just to be clear, uh, it, it's evident that I wasn't the first choice to moderate this event, right? <laughs> uh, but she declined, so <laughs> there's an excuse. Uh, I know we exhausted our amount of time uh, given by the organizer, but I would still like to break the rule because the rules are still there to be broken. And I'm a political scientist. I know, I know what I'm talking about. So... I would still like to uh, give the opportunity to the public to actually respond to what they heard about, uh, we were, uh, about what we were talking uh, today. So is there any comment, uh, burning wish to uh, ad address um, his or her point, uh, question? Yes. Um. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Alenka Flander. I come from the National Agency of Erasmus Plus in Slovenia. So it's very valuable for us to hear all the um, transformational potential that uh, this uh, uh, university initiative is bringing. And I would actually have uh, two questions. One for the two examples of the learning communities. Um, and um, for them, I would like to ask, I mean, how do you see the potential or why this could not be part of the regular curricula? I mean, why is part of the extra curricular activities? 
I mean, this could be a blunt question from an outsider of the university, but I mean, still, I, I would be interesting to hear. And the other would be maybe to um, Professor De Gelan, maybe, I mean, but some other um, expert or um, uh, representatives from other university could um, maybe also um, fill in. Um, I would like to hear how do you see the new models of Erasmus Plus mobility, like blended intensive programs, um, as a potential to support this learning community, because as a short opportunities for international students to meet, it would probably, I mean, from my view, perfectly fit to the, what you provided with the learning community. So, and um, maybe also, how do you see to stimulate the classical, I would say, Erasmus mobility within the partnership? Is this something that you put an effort to, um, to enhance this collaboration or, I mean, okay, I'll stop. Yeah. Many other questions. Thank you. Uh, maybe Natasha or uh, Vas oh, yeah. Yes, uh, I actually don't think there's any reason why it could not, our activity could not be incorporated. We actually tried that with our students last uh, semester and it worked, but it didn't work for all the partner universities. So I think this is the next step now. <laughs> you? Uh, yeah, maybe uh, one reason is that uh, in our particular case, this was a very intensive two week modular type of activity, right? So we we thought about integrating it into a course that we have on economic policies of the EU, but that course is a semester course uh, and also it has a lot of students. So this is doable in a smaller setting, let's say. But we are now trying to do it the other way, as I, as I said, uh, trying to integrate it into uh, a new program that we're developing where uh, the number of students will be smaller. Uh, and also trying to recognize it if students will um, if students will will take this as an extra uh, co-curricular activity, as we call them, uh, the university. Yeah, I'll just say one word on that. Absolutely, and it's an excellent question. Actually, the aim is to embed in the curriculum ASAP, and what our colleagues are actually doing is exactly that. Now everybody knows that it takes an enormous amount of effort for educational change uh, and what colleagues do uh, is to test uh, in, in many ways, depending on obviously communities and so on, what they do is to test an activity in the co-curricular space uh, and then uh, design the embedding. And that's actually really the power of the model that we already have a number of those learning activities embedded or carrying ECTS uh, as we actually already heard uh, already from the first round after the sort of the pilot and that is the how we manage to actually have learning activities as sort of separate products while we all know designing a whole program from scratch takes years of effort and the colleagues I think are touching upon the, the, what, what we've achieved with having this learning environment where we can test, embed, and provide a, a pathway into utopia. And I think we have this shared dream uh, of, in the near future, being able to go on any of the participating universities and seeing e utopia labels and pathways across programs with those activities that actually build innovation from within uh, and, and sort of in a modular, in a modular way. Thank excellent you. question. Thank you for this question. It's really excellent. Yeah, it is. And, and I'll just make two remarks about that. First of all, the um, credit which could be used for, uh, well, for, for some sort of domicile of, of this activity is something we worked with. But obviously, it's clear that uh, particularly the collaboration between partners leads to some sort of other uh, avenues, yeah, other prod uh, products. And uh, what we wanted to be very clear from the start is that we're not prescriptive because uh, everyone thinks about the course. Okay, it could be the course, it could be something else. And uh, I remember one conversation with one leader of one learning unit who said, but give me some uh, guidance, give me some in a way, regulation. No, we don't want to give that to you. You have the autonomy, but autonomy is uh, in that sense, also hard. Uh, so we're actually exploring, and I think one of the avenues well explored uh, was uh, by the colleagues from the 
School of Economics and Business, who actually explored what we have, co-curricular activity, which you can actually accredit uh, at the university, and then it's a credit-bearing unit. So there are many different scenarios already in place here at the University of Ljubljana uh, within other partner institutions, and uh, what we are doing is actually, well, exploring as well as identifying what's, what are the best, uh, I guess, avenues of cooperation that we want to support after uh, the pilot phase. And also about the mobilities, like COVID was tough, yeah? Uh, Vasya explained it was tough, Natasha explained it was, it was tough for us as well, because what we did at the beginning was we looked at our collaboration that existed prior to that. We actually wanted to enrich that collaboration and take advantage of every other opportunity uh, for mobilities of students, of staff, and, and various other activities that we had in order to actually allow this autonomy to thrive, right? So I don't think it will be in any way in conflict with what the, the program is, um, uh, uh, is promoting. It's something that will help add a additional complexity or additional autonomy to our teams. Yeah, I just want to add that uh, uh, it's absolutely, it's actually designed, the model is designed to use all these other tools. And we already have BIPs uh, anyway in sort of, um, and, and I think, uh, is that what you wanted to say? Something? No, yeah. Probably. Anyway, yeah, no. Yeah. For yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so the idea, so the broad is that we all have different policy tools, and we, as we all have pro, pro, programs and projects and so on, we also have tools. Some are internal, funding, seed funding, da da da, all that ways to recognise, ways to actually give, motivate students. We also have tools like Erasmus. We have tools like Bips and so on. What we're doing here is to create the relationship and the conditions to actually use all those, so, and to also strengthen the relationship with national agencies uh, of all types, national agencies. One of the binaries that is also very problematic is for us to think universities or regulators, universities or agencies, all those either or are très passé. I mean, we can't work like that. We really need a very different ecosystem that brings the stakeholders together. So absolutely, we need that because a utopia would never be able to support physical mobility anyway. So, and it's not the role. True, true, and then uh, the new, uh, the new uh, utopia more is even uh, more uh, such a such a beast. So basically, we will need to take advantage of everything out out there. So, um, is there any other? Uh, yeah, question, please. Roland Hintersl from Venice. It's, it's a kind of a follow-up. I, I can see these were very specialized, very exciting activities, but uh, the core question is in Utopia more. Um, we need to think of ways to integrate them in an existing curriculum to have a long-term effect. Otherwise, this will be one times, two times exciting activities, but uh, I think we want something more. We want to have uh, the sustainability means the long-term effect of this. Uh, so it seems to me crucial what you have been starting to discuss, uh, um, you know, that we need to find ways to integrate it. And I think it's going to be crucial. And as a linguist, I have a question to both Professor Hirz, if, uh, if I can. <laughs> How did you evaluate the, the activities and what do you think the students learned about text and discourse analysis, you did not mention what were the learning benefits. Um, over, we only, this was our last year, was our first time activity, so it was just a pilot project really, so this year probably we'll be able to give you some more, I, we'll all be able to get some more idea on uh, the evaluative uh, process, but uh, we'd given them like a post-task questionnaire 
and uh, just ask them for their opinion. And then during the session, also ask them personally, or well, uh, online, <laughs> if that counts as a person to person, uh, how they felt about it, whether or not they would want to do it again. And several students said that they would want to do it not only again, but for different language combinations as well. So I guess that's a plus. And, um, you know, loads of people go and pay loads of money for conversation <laughs> classes. And if our students can have this extracurricular activity when they can do it for free, why not? They do see the benefit, yeah. But uh, whether or not we'll be able to embed it as part of um, our existing curricula, I, I don't know. It, it takes a lot of negotiations because these are not students that I teach in my particular, any of my modules, for instance, but there are other people's classes where they actually... So I have to persuade my colleagues to allow some time to promote the event and uh, also talk to them how possibly we could find the venue within our department to embed certain some of these activities into their own curricula. And then also these other partners from Europe and how they try to, so this is really something that is quite difficult if you don't talk to the students within your own module, but have to talk to your colleagues. So, you know, it's a lot of collaboration on all sorts of levels, not only um, across Europe, but also within the department. If I may add, the colleague explains it very well. It is also linked, of course, and it was very well shown by Anna Maria in her report on buyers and neighbors. There's not only the rules that are imposed on us, but there's also the rules that we impose on ourselves in our universities as for curriculum development, as for dealing with optional courses, as for, yeah, facilitating or making it difficult to go across disciplines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so, so this is also something that in a lot of communities you work in stages. You, you start with something that is integrated or part of an integrated course. Then the partners come along and they try to, yeah, of course, um, cooperate. A and then it can be very different from partner to partner if they have an easy job integrating this in their home curricula or not. And that is still something that we now start to see in the third year, let's say, uh, operational year, that, yeah, as, as, as um, our colleague indicated, they have to go back to their uh, uh, program directors and, 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 and their people responsible for curriculum development at the central level to, to verify if it's possible for them also to integrate. Eh? So, uh, and and, and it, ha it often happens. I think more and more communities are now evolving towards that stage that they, that they find possibilities for doing it. But we, I fully agree that it, it, you have to do it because otherwise it's going to be... Uh, and and uh, some have already embedded quite yeah. a lot. So in a sense, I'm just sort of thinking off the top of my head. I mean, I can actually, I think we had... Uh, uh, with uh, Melina, uh, who is over there supporting two of our communities, we had some conversation about uh, communities who from the start embedded. So in a sense, after doing a short pilot, uh, embedded activities so that they actually sort of would grow. Right. Uh, I hate to kill this debate, but I have to. <laughs> Uh, in order to, well, respect your time and other commitments, uh, I would like to thank our speakers, particularly the learning communities here with us today, uh, as well as organizers of this event, and uh, of course you participants for your patience and your questions, and hopefully we'll be able to continue this debate because it's going to be a long one. Now, if you're interested in the uh, educa Utopia educational model, you can find more information on the Utopia website where all the 30 learning communities planets are presented as well as their contacts and what they do. Uh, so feel free to look at it. Uh, it's an interesting site with lots of ideas as well as a clear indication about how many people actually uh, collaborate uh, from various points of view or from, from various perspectives. So with this in mind, thank you for today uh, and hopefully you'll have a wonderful dinner, dinner afterwards. Uh, at least a part of the bunch I know uh, is joining us, but I guess uh, there are many dinners take, taking place. So, well, bon appetit and thank you very much. <laughs>